Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Here is a gathering to talk about the nostalgia and all the underlying emotions that come with it. In Reigns, Nostalgia, Betrayal and Romance, we have with us Mr. Jayant Kripalani. Welcome, sir. He's an Indian. <laughs> he is an Indian film, television, and stage actor and director. He is best known for his performances in television series such as Khandan, Mr. Ya Mrs., and G. Mantriji. He's actively involved with theater and continues to act on stage as well as on screen. In conversation with him, we have Madhuri Iyer, who is an author and an advertising copywriter. She is the author of the best-selling novel, Manhattan Mango, for which she is scripting a Bollywood screenplay, and the Supermom Cookbook, a non-fiction title that introduces moms to the joy of healthy cooking. Please, sir, you may start the conversation. Uh, Ms. Koral Das Gupta will join you in a bit. She's on her way. Ladies and gentlemen, give them a big round of applause. <laughs> Welcome, sir. So, Rain's Nostalgia, Betrayal, and Romance, all for you to take. Hello, can you hear me? Good. Looks like somebody has uh, used this mic to bash somebody on the head with it. It's <laughs> all sort of bent and seen better days, but as long as you can hear me, I suppose that's all right. Yes. Uh, while we're waiting for the moderator, uh, who, uh, who, who was supposed who's to. Who's on her way? She's on her way. Yeah, I'm sure we can say some nostalgic things about her. <laughs> uh, is she is she for real or is she a memory or is she a dream? Uh, where is she? That I think is uh, a question that needs to be answered. Uh, but I think rather than, would you like to start off? Uh, well, our subjects today, we're going to talk about the monsoons and romance and nostalgia. So when we were having a little, you know, pre-session talk and uh, Jen says to me, okay, I don't think I'll be doing the romance. Do you mind doing that one? <laughs> so yeah, we're just going to have a nice open session and I'm sure it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, what would you like to say about the monsoon? What do you think it was this year? Good, bad, ugly? How bad was it? Well, I'm, I'm not too sure about the monsoons, but I had this, uh, uh, I used to have this intense uh, passion for the rains. Uh, nowadays, I'm not so sure. Um, uh, when I think of the, you know, I, I used to stand in my flat in Bombay, which is on the 10th floor of a suburban building, and look wistfully out at the Bay of, what is it, no, the Arabian Sea, and, you know, wait for the monsoon to come sweeping across and then look down, you know, uh, and, and the water would be waist level. And so I went off the monsoons very fast after that. Um, and, and being romantic about the rains is, is, is not my cup of tea anymore. <laughs> I, I, it's, and if anything, the, the news items in the newspapers over the last few weeks about uh, famous doctors falling into manholes and disappearing is anything to go by, then I, for one, am absolutely sure I'm not over enamored with that kind of weather. Yeah. Okay, now I beg to differ because I just love the monsoon and whoever does, just put your hands up, please. <laughs> okay, I think this is a very Indian cultural thing. We just love our rains, you know, which comes once a year. And you oh, know I have nothing against the rains. It's the aftermath of the, the rains. It's the aftermath, yes. okay. You know, interestingly, I've lived a lot in Canada too. And uh, when I was living there for a period of time, and every time it rained, I would say, wow, there comes the rain. And they gave me this very strange look. It's like, you know, is she for real? She really likes the rain? Because out there, they just want sunshine, right? So it just, it goes to show it's all about where you're coming from. I mean, for a hot tropical country, when it rains, we love it. And in Canada, when it rains, they're like, oh, we want to see the sun. You know, so it's interesting. 
And what we build around the rain is so fascinating. It's, it has so much of you know, meaning and subtext, and I s you see it in novels, in movies, in poetry, in music. So it's, it's a very interesting uh, you know, cultural aspect, which I think is very unique to us when we talk about, it's not the rains we're talking about, we're talking about the monsoons, actually, which is fascinating. Have you seen that movie or read the book, Chasing the Monsoons? No, I have not. It's, it's, uh, I haven't uh, had the fortune to actually read the book or to, to see the movie, but uh, I have read chapters of the book. And uh, the, the sorry, you know, my memory is all, all over the place. So I've forgotten the name of the gentleman who wrote the book. But he actually chased the monsoons uh, across from uh, when, when they came streaming. And does, does anybody remember who the author was? Sorry? There you go. There you go. And it was uh, uh, the, the, his, some of his descriptions of the sweeping rains and the effect that they had and the, the how the earth came alive, you know, uh, was absolutely fascinating. And yeah, I can understand why people like the rains and why they like the monsoons in, in our but I can also understand why why people don't, you know. I mean, there is a flip side to it. Yeah, ask somebody in Chirapunji. I'm <laughs> not too sure if they'd be over fond of, <laughs> of the rains, you know. Uh, th 300, last, last year there were 311 days of rain in Chirapunji. And, you know, not rain like, oh, isn't that pleasant? No, rain that is here. You can't see the tree behind it, you know, that kind of rain. So, uh, yeah, now on the nostalgia, any nostalgia and rain moments that you can recall, which go back, you know? I, I, as I said, I, I, I can't get nostalgic about the rains. I, I, the two, two major instances in, in Bombay, one was, I think, in 2005, yeah. uh, in, in July of 2005. Hey, I wasn't there, so I missed the whole thing. And uh, uh, then this last one again, I missed the whole thing. Yeah, you know, rains, yeah, they're fun. But uh, I don't remember, and I, c I can't get nostalgic about rains, because for me, it brings back my childhood memories. And I was in Calcutta in, in, in during my childhood. And the place that I lived in, Charingalane, used to have pavement dwellers. And uh, everything that they ate, drank, and <laughs> regurgitated from both their orifices, used to float by in the water, and it used to be okay, a little, uh, okay. I, 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 I can't get uh, nostalgic <laughs> yeah, yeah, about yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so let's talk about other nostalgia. Jent, what, what, what top of the mind, you know, like, okay, 70s is a decade I relate to. It was my college days, and, you know, it was a very different time and place. So uh, any interesting stuff that you want to talk about then? You know, I <laughs> I'd actually prepared a speech on nostalgia, but then I started crying when I read it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now that really calls uh, for it to be shared, so please, you know. Only because it was so badly written, not because... Uh, 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 <laughs> uh, you know, for me, nostalgia is, is, is many, many little, little memories from... from uh, this time... Uh, uh, oh, I've shifted back. I've, I've gone back to my old home in Calcutta, and I happened to be walking down uh, Park Street and walked into the Park Street post office. If there are any Calcuttans here, they'll know what the Park Street post office is. It isn't anymore, the Park Street post office, like it used to be. Uh, gone are those, that old wooden, heavy wooden look, and there used to be these brass cages uh, behind which gentlemen who'd seen uh, better days still dispense their services. Uh, now it's all flash. It's marble. It's red painted. Uh, um, but it still, it still smells of that. I don't know. Do, you, do, you, do any of you remember this green, glutinous, coagulated mass of snot that used to pass as glue? Uh, <laughs> do you remember that? Yeah. Uh, you know, there's, uh, it's still there. The smell of a post office has not changed. Thank God for that, you know. And uh, 
the, the other it's thing quite pungent i i i recall it absolutely yeah yeah hum to hum to uh, uh, jab bachche the to uh, we used to slip into the post office and steal a bit of that put on a bit of paper and rush out of there because it was the best damn thing to repair a torn kite and you know we were all sort of fanatic about kite flying and we, of course they tore when and but we didn't have funds that you went and bought 10 kites you bought two kites and you last it lasted for about 8 to 10 days thank god for the post office at that lay i think it was called lay uh, yeah Uh, the other thing that i missed in the i don't know i i'm, I'm going to just refer to my notes over here because it was a quite a there was a um, you know the old parcels uh the the parcel section of a post office is something i remember with with great love and affection i don't know how that system worked at all ever because there would be these people who would come in to give their parcels for to to send and then they'd get wrapped into this white cloth which the post office supplied and they'd stitch it and then using a a wooden stick with a piece of cloth wrapped around it they would dip it into a black uh, thingy and then write the address which the person giving sending the parcel would tell them and i swear to god the the address that was on the cardboard parcel was nothing like the one that went to to the cloth it it took on a life of its own you know and uh, how the parcels ever reached anywhere is 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 is, is something that at this time when i went there everything was the same you know, in, what in they still had parcels in white cloth yep wow, yep Abs- okay. absolutely but uh, but what what really brought back memories were were, were some of the names Uh, uh, of the of the villages over there uh, that were all towns uh, there was a place called rani band uh, i never heard of rani band and it it brought back uh, it, it no, not brought back it it brought visions of a interesting place called rani band i wonder what is like keto gram was another one a pandabeshwar pandabeshwar i don't know what it means but it it uh, conjures up or oh, you know perhaps uh, orange clad pandas uh, walking around and telling your life story and uh, t- telling your history to you uh, then there was a place which was an absolute favorite chingra gola shawl i don't know what that is and i don't know what it means hi curl please a uh, big hand for a moderator and you know normally i would get annoyed but i know she has a little boy Uh, who probably who's probably still awake she must have fallen asleep while trying to put him to bed <laughs> anyway welcome and uh, you okay you looking a bit uh, yeah oh uh, really sorry to everybody present here i just got caught up in a very bad traffic hmm. and uh, okay. sorry all that i have to say forgiven <laughs> and there's one parcel that i saw w- which uh, uh, w- which in cheek me i mean it it you you recognize the place it it was it's close to uh, here it it the parcel was going to a place called bhosri and i i thought of the conversation that might have taken place are ye kahan ka parcel hai ye bhosri ka parcel hai you know so these are things that uh, that <laughs> Th- these are things that that I, that will soon these things will be those were memories and these are things that will become will, yeah, new yeah, me- yeah, memories yeah, i think yeah yeah, yeah. so uh, something else more interesting oh yeah yeah <laughs> the nostalgia trip uh, can i stay in the post office or do i need to get out of the post you office you can be where you want <laughs> time and place <laughs> <laughs> is it really i have you <laughs> No, you know, uh my my family will back me up on this. I walked up to the window and I wanted I said since I'm here I'm a bit tired of emailing and SMSing and what's happening and things. I said I'm going to start writing letters again. I I love the thought of a, a a gentle elegant letter in cursive writing uh one alphabet merging into the next. 
Uh, there's probably a WhatsApp coming. God, I could kill him. And uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, things like that. But so I thought, uh, you know, I'm going I'm going to write a letter to my son, who is who is who's who's an SMS WhatsApp person. Of course, he writes too, but I felt I'd write him a postcard. And I went to buy one, and this man behind the counter looked at me like I was some fossil, and I was, who had, oh, am, who, 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 who walked in there to get this postcard. And I said, what have you got? He said, I've got one postcard, uh, two postcards and one inland letter. I said, I want an envelope. He said, no. I said, what do you mean? He said, this is all I have. You want it? Take it. So I think I bought the last remnants of the Indian postal system that afternoon. Uh, from Park Street Post Office. And so I wrote this letter. This is January of this year. I wrote this letter, postcard to my son, thinking he'd be surprised when he gets it. And uh, waited for a reply. I didn't get that. I was getting more and more annoyed. Uh, eight months later, in August, I got a WhatsApp. Of course, it had to be a WhatsApp. So, hey, Pops, just got your postcard. So, you know, <laughs> I guess it's the postcard in the inland letter. It said, has had its time, at least in urban uh, India. Um, I, I'm assuming that those uh, 100 and 100,000 villages that we've just learned have been electrified, have their computers and their email services, if they have the electricity. Yeah, yeah. I'll just quickly, you know, just add to what he was saying on nostalgia, talking about cursive writing, right? So in school, uh, you know, back in the day when we didn't have the tablet and the computer and the what have you, but we had like notebooks covered with brown paper with double lines and a pencil and a rubber. And if you were fancy, you had a nylon rubber, maybe from Singapore or Hong Kong, with your name, with your initial with your initial on it, right? So if, if I was Madhuri, I wanted an M. If not, if I didn't have the budget, I would have that little rubber rubber which left a mark on my page. But that's neither here nor there. So that was what we had. I still remember grade two, grade three. You started your day in school writing the date on the, <laughs> the right hand top the date, and then you started your work with the title, and then you started your cursive writing, whatever it was, a little essay or a piece or whatever. And then as you started on second line, the pencil point broke. <laughs> so you took out the sharpener. And then you know you had this lovely black suit all over your hands and your clothes, and but that was OK. You just continued. You sharpened and you continued, and you sharpened and you continued, and, and life went on, you know? So now when I look at the kids, and I'm like, wow, just for a day, I would like them to do it. It teaches you patience. I tell you, it really teaches you patience, where you have to sit and do pages of writing with a pencil and a rubber, you know? It's, it's something. OK. So with apologies, once again, I'll start. Um, you know, nostalgia and the kind of things that happens to us or happen to us is always, uh, it leaves an impression. I have been in Mumbai for about, is it audible now? Yeah. I have been in Mumbai for about 10 years now. And the best memories that I have of Mumbai is with the auto guys. Usually, I ditch my car and take the auto. And this particular journey with the auto guy started way back when one of the days I was coming from Versova to Malad. And I'm very bad with directions. And, uh, and this auto guy was just hearing zub zap zim zam. So at one moment, I asked the guy that, Bhaiya, aapko rasta malum hai? He said, Rasta kaise nahi malum hoga, madam? Rasta hi to hamara hai. Varna manjil to sabari ka hota hai. <laughs> <laughs> this came from an auto guy. <laughs> so when it comes to nostalgia, probably all of us have a lot to pour. So I'll start with you, sir, that your book is has a very strong premise in Calcutta. It uh, Kolkata now, but probably your book is about Calcutta. And uh, 
there are quite some typical things that Calcutta offers uh, both humorously and otherwise. So Bengalis are known to start late, reach late, do everything late. Would you have something to say about that? Um, I uh, would agree with you this, that this was uh, something. I'm not going to be funny about this because I suddenly had a thought that uh, one of the reasons I left Calcutta uh, in 1980, whatever, 80, 81, was because the Bengalis, I hesitate to say the Bengalis in, because I'm on, as the Bengalis say, I am a non-Bengali. You know, you can go anywhere in the world and you can be Indian, you can be Maharashtran. No one will say you're a non-Maharashtran. Like the Bengalis will say you're a non-Bengali. So I feel a little uh, apprehensive criticizing them. But I feel more like a Bengali than a lot of Bengalis I know do. So uh, I'm going to take the liberty of, while saying while uh, 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 expressing myself uh, that I'm going to be talking like a Bengali at the moment, not like a Sindhi residing in Bengal. Before I left for Bombay, uh, about being late, uh, I don't think I ever did a meeting. Uh, there was always a reason for the other person not to show up. Why be late? I mean, why show up at all? And... <laughs> The, 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 the thing was, uh, dude, I'm, I'm sure everybody has a smattering of Bengali, which was, will you do this for me? Uh, the, 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 the answer was Hobena. Sorry, Hobena. Hobena was the, the, the driving, <laughs> I don't think driving, motivating, but you know what I mean. It was what ruled the Bengali professional world. And my heart hurts to say this. But I think that could be one of the reasons why, uh, 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 you know, industry sort of started flowing out of of of, of Calcutta. Uh, there, there's this marvelous line which uh, I was reminded of recently, where the the worker, the the guy in the office, I'll translate as I said. He says, "Kaj porchi maine pai." that I work, so I get my salary. I, I, I'm in a job, so I get my salary. Kaj kurte, overtime chai. If I have to work, then I want overtime. So that was pretty much uh, uh, what, what was happening. And so when we went for a holiday, my wife and I went for a holiday, came to Bombay for a holiday. Her parents were here then, on, on, and we never went back. Never went back. Things just things just worked over here, and it was a, it, it in Bombay. Bombay was a city that had a work ethic that we could relate to, and uh, so we actually never went back. Actually, I went back to pack a trunk. It took her one day to get a job. It took me one week to get a job, and we just never went back after that. So uh, that was the difference. Now, thirty plus years later, I'm thrilled that I'm back in Calcutta. Because things happen. Uh, Hobina has is not in the vocabulary. It is definitely Cheshtakur. What we'll try. But it's a remarkable improvement from Hobina. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll try and they do try and by and large we get our work done. Uh, uh, so I'm that's my take on 35 years and being away from Bengal, going back to Bengal. I think that is uh, what I find, I don't know if uh, the people who move back with me to Calcutta will agree with me on that, but uh, I, that's what I think. Madhuri, what's your take on uh, the personal resistance probably that uh, Sir had been referring to, that uh, professionally and personally there is a resistance towards work, towards following your heart probably, is there? I've never lived in Calcutta, so I mean I can't really, yeah. But I have spent uh, three, four years of my professional life in Delhi. And what he's describing in Calcutta pretty much duplicates in Delhi, where it's, uh, you know, everyone's pretty chill. And it's like, when's the next meal? Oh, it's lunchtime. OK, let's go kind of thing. So uh, no, I've not really, because I've been professionally in Mumbai, uh, which I think looks uh, very, very professional compared to the 
to the rest of the country probably. I mean, I, I don't know. I remember before, I, we used to have uh, four hour lunches at this place called Olympia on Park Street. Uh, we'd, we'd be there one hour before lunch and uh, three hours after. And uh, stroll into a toddler into the office <laughs> around four o'clock and then start working if, if we felt like it. Uh, that, that culture has changed. Uh, Olympia is by and large empty at lunchtime these days. It's crowded in, in, in the evening, but at lunchtime it's kind of empty. And I think that's a great change uh, that's taking place. I can only, of course, talk about the milieu that I lived in. I, ca I can't talk about Calcutta or at large. Uh, but yeah. No, actually, with what you said, na, I thought that uh, I, being a Bengali, I'm completely exposed. But with wo with what she said, I can very safely say that Delhi is worse, which again is probably a Bengali trait that we push behind things. But every Bengali I've met in Bombay works as works very hard. I mean, uh, uh, very very hard, especially in the film business and the music business and the. Uh, even in the advertising, uh, I mean, they work their butts off. And why is it? And of course, then I get this complaint about the Marathis who don't work in Maharashtra. But why, how come they're so successful when they go to America? Yeah, it's something about, I think, this ethnic thing that you, in where, why do I, in Calcutta, I, I have to tell you this. I have to, I'm sorry, I'm hogging the mic like this, my apologies. Uh, there's a, there's, I mentioned this, I think, in one of my books, I'm not sure one of the two books, uh, I'm not sure, is um, my father's landlord uh, 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 shut, rent, shut his shop down and, and gave the place to my father and said, you take it for 10 rupees rent or something. I'm talking about a long time ago. Mm. My father said, but what will you do? And he said, uh, what do you mean, what will I do? He said, no, no, you, why, you can't just shut your shop. What will you do for a living? And he said, you know, working for a living, and that's so vulgar, you know. <laughs> and that, that he had a reason for this. Uh, there is a reason when that by and large Bengalis think that working for a living is vulgar because the land is so fertile there. I don't need to work. Let the rice grow. Let my thoughts grow. I'll write poetry. I'll... I'll, I'll, I'll become a writer, I'd think about beautiful things. Working for a living? God, how vulgar can you be, you know? So uh, I miss, sometimes I miss that, yeah. It's impractical, but I miss it. You know, uh, once in Bangalore, this happened to me, that there was this bus, and uh, one guy was coming, running from the other side, asking, uh, the bus just stopped in the stand. And there was this guy who came from the other side asking, to be, to be, to be. He was asking about the bus number. And there was this guy sitting on the window. He just watched him very indifferently and said, to be or not to be, that is the question. The bus went away. So <laughs> the guy, I was standing in the bus stand and watching the guy right there howling <laughs> curses. <laughs> but then I guess this kind of thing happens in very, I mean, sudden moments at the spur of the of moment and uh, that is the pulse of the city i guess uh, there was a time in calcutta when they first introduced minibuses uh, only graduates were allowed to drive or uh, uh, work on minibuses and uh, because there was a bad bad times were there and the gra uh, gra there weren't enough jobs for graduates and uh, so you had these conductors who were very well read and uh, she w walks up to this guy and says, ticket. So this rather posh Bengali gentleman who <laughs> uh, perhaps mispronounced the word that day, he, he gave him money and he says, Elgin Road, as opposed to Elgin Road. You know, He says, I'm going to Elgin Road. So the conductor took the money and said, Jod Jod, really? You know? <laughs> yeah. So that's 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 the uh, that's the side of uh, the yeah. Uh, Madhuri, I uh, have heard that monsoon makes a w w takes a very important role in your writing. Is that true? 
No, I wouldn't say that. No, not really. But you know, I have started out with a romance novel, so I think uh, you know a lot of people think that I probably can talk a little more about that. Uh, romance as it is today, again, is very different from the way it used to be. So my first novel, which was uh, called Pink Champagne, was a romance set in, um, in the US. And the second one called Manhattan Mango was also set in the US. And that is about, you know, young people in a very, you know, like uh, it, it, today's, ge our generation, my generation, I don't know if I would even call it romance. It's so quick. Things move so fast. You finish one relationship and you're on to the next. So what is so romantic about that, you know? That's something to ask. But it is romance, I suppose, 21st century, you know, of Gen Y and, you know, the next generation. But yeah, Monsoon, I did one novel which was set in Goa. And very interestingly, you know, I have this heroine. It's like the Gulmohar is in peak summer and it's really, really hot. Goa gets really hot in summer. And then, I don't know why subconsciously, when the rains come is when she meets this guy. I think it was just <laughs> me talking about the rains, you know. She meets this guy and the romance blooms and all. But why didn't it happen in summer? I mean, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I think it's just so into your psyche that romance is rain. So perhaps there's a connection. You know, uh, your whatever you just said brings me to a very important discussion that romance changes even half a generation the def definition of romance is very different the perception of romance is very different so does that restrict us authors with the audience we are trying to cater to when i write do i write for an audience which will understand what i am talking about but beyond that or after that someone who is half a generation before me or half a generation after me feels absolutely disconnected do you feel that you know, that's a very interesting question because when I started writing, I was already touching 50. So for me to identify with... <laughs> so how old do you think I'm now? <laughs> so, you know, for me to identify with the younger generation was not, was not easy, especially for a writer to sound contemporary. But fortunately for me, I've got two daughters who fitted my, <laughs> my uh, you know, sort of uh, the, the target I was wanting to talk to. Because I didn't want to do a romance for 50-somethings. I mean, it didn't make sense. So the daughters had some great contributions when it came to telling me, Mom, nobody does that. Mom, you know, you can just, uh, I mean, people hook up after two meetings. It's OK. You know, he can sleep with her. It's not a big deal. And I'm like, really? I mean, that soon? So, you know, it's like it's such a different perspective. And everybody has a different. I mean, I've. The same person, young, in a more conservative city in India could be saying, no, it doesn't happen. In Mumbai or wherever, you could be saying, yes, it happens. So I think everyone's take on romance is so unique. You know, what's romantic for me may not be romantic for some. Now, if I listen to Mohammed Rafi, they're like, ee, what are you doing, you know? But for me, Rafi is very romantic, so hello. So, uh, you know, that's interesting how... <laughs> Yeah, so it's interesting. So as, a, as an author who wants to write for younger people, I do run it by uh, my daughters and other their friends, and I get some very interesting feedback. I, I don't write for an audience. Okay. So it's you are writing to fulfill yourself. I don't write to fulfill myself either. <laughs> What is your philosophy, <laughs> sir, as a, as a... No, I just write. I enjoy writing. I, I like the business of writing. I like the isolation of writing. I, I like the... Uh, 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 I'm, I'm so fond of what I write that I don't give a damn if it's published or not, as long, long as I enjoy it. And I've been lucky, is, is the way to say it, that, that somebody suggested this, and I gave it to him, and it worked, and then Nippon could hear picked up the other one and uh, so uh, but I wouldn't be able I wouldn't begin to be able to describe an audience uh, for for my writing I'm amazed that anybody reads it at all but you know uh, I'm quite happy where where it works but you know you were talking about young love and uh, things like that since 
I don't know why you don't write about middle-aged love. It could be fun. But <laughs> uh, I, I want to tell you a little story. There's a... One sequence. Fun for whom? Uh, for the younger lot or for the middle-aged lot? Uh, for both. Why not? You know, that's where the young lot are going, ultimately. <laughs> you know, I have a middle-aged love screenplay which I've been trying to sell for the last 10 years, and Bollywood tells me no one's going to watch it, yeah. don't bother. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So don't make it for Bollywood. Uh, my hus my, my uh, 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 son worked on a screenplay and actually made the film uh, uh, about uh, 60 year old, took a couple of us in the 60s. And of course it hasn't worked, but my God, it's a great film, you know. So, But anyway, getting back to what I was saying before. Uh, uh, I don't, you know, <laughs> we're talking about nostalgia and, and now you talk about love. And one of my favorite books was uh, uh, Simone, Senior, Simone Signorette, that ac uh, the actor from France. Uh, she, she was one of the fine, she got an Academy Award for the Room at the Top in 1959 when I was just 10 or something like that. Um, and she was married to Yves Montan. Yeah. And uh, God, my, I've lost the train of thought now. Yeah. Uh, she. Her definition of love was something that I found uh, really remarkable. And she, she, she wrote this, I think, in 1978, when she was well into her 70s or 80s or whatever, 80s. And uh, she said that uh, somebody told her, you know, Marilyn Monroe is in love with Yves Montan. And she said, what do you want me to do about it? Get angry? All I can do is I admire her taste. I am so in love with him that she must be doing the right thing, you know. So there's that kind of love at that age, which is also uh, something to write about. And then I must tell you about what Yves Montan's reply to that was. He said, at my age, in a marriage, uh, a man can have an affair twice, or maybe thrice. More than that, that's cheating. <laughs> Okay. See, nostalgia, I understand, is something which is very different from memory. Memory is something, nostalgia is something else. Now, my next question comes from this particular point, that we are constantly bruised by the kind of things that we go through in our lives, and that shapes our personality, the author's personality. We are conservative to, cer to a certain extent, romantic to a certain extent, uh, irrelevant to a certain extent. Now. When we write our books, when we shape our characters, if a character demands, which often happens, if a character demands that uh, that character is nowhere close to our personalities or we don't identify with that character, how easy or how difficult does it become? No, I think it's very easy because you're putting yourself in that character's shoes. So it doesn't matter how far that person is from your own personality. Like when I wrote, you know, and uh, the protagonist was a young guy from Manhattan Mango, three, three young guys, not one. And people said, oh, you know, uh, uh, people actually asked me, so how, do, how could you write about these young guys who are in New York, you know, living in Manhattan? It's like to say, oh, and you're this older lady who, you know, wouldn't understand what's happening. But no, they're humans. I mean, you know, they go, they have the same emotions, the same uh, ups and downs, you know. Nothing's really different. Okay, they're, uh, you know, uh, end of the day, it's the same life that everyone's living, you know. I mean, that's the way I see it. Actually, I forgot the question. Sorry, what? I say that uh, nostalgia comes from your, uh, I mean, your memories or your the chain of events that you go through constantly shapes your character, your personality, and you pick up your traits from there. So does that impair you as an author while writing your characters, your personal, your personal limitations? No. I'm going to keep it short. No. I I do not. Uh, my experiences are not. Uh, my my characters are other people. They, their experiences are their experiences. Their memories are their memories. Uh, I might create some memories for them, but it's them. I'm very detached from the people. I, of course, I love them after I've written about them, but I'm very detached from uh, them while writing about them. Because uh, they 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 lead they lead lives in my mind that I would never have the courage to lead, 
you know so they are completely different people and more power to them and later on when i pick up one year later i read about this character said i couldn't have written this you know does that detachment happen with you in fact the other very interesting thing i find in fact uh, is even with multiple characters i never know what they're going to do when i start writing a novel i honestly do not know what they're going to do and then they just seem to start doing their own thing and i'm just writing so sometimes i'm like you know who's actually working on these characters because i'm not doing it when one interacts with another a third thing is happening and it's happening automatically and i'm like yeah that's probably the way it should happen i think they doing the right thing but if you ask me like you know then what happens next i won't have an answer and I, this is i really mean it seriously i don't know what happens next what you say it is probably that your conscious and subconscious are two different personalities <laughs> do you <laughs> no no you don't have to be that because what you say it happens with me as well uh, that i have no clue i just know the first few lines of the story that i write and after that it happens things keep happening by themselves sir what is your uh, process of writing is it uh, is the does the story write itself or you have the entire premise in mind before you start no uh, i'll tell you how i write i take a sheet of paper and <laughs> lift a pen and that's how i write uh, there's no plan there's no uh, 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 nothing yeah there's a there's a one line story uh, as in cantilever tales the, the it's a, it's a, it's a young middle class bengali boy against a big builder but again that's not the s- that was not the that that's just the hook on which i have uh, uh hung all these marvelous characters that 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 are there so you know that's that's just this one line and then on that one line you hang all these people who make the end happen but the if you if you it's available by the way uh, published by reader mania and all bookshops around the country it's called cantilever tales thank you uh, <laughs> i needed a little commercial there commercial break uh uh-huh. <laughs> so you know uh, yeah that's it you don't I, you have to sit that's the process i i at least i you have to sit at that damn table whether you produce shit or not you have to sit at that damn table and at the end of it you look at what you've got and you it's so easy right after after you've done the pen work and you put it onto the machine there your first edit is done and then you look at it and says it sucks and it's so easy you just drag it down to the trash bin and start again you know uh or <laughs> you know life has life is like that now thank god and but when you want to keep it and refer to it later there's another little thing which you know you hit this little minus mark and <laughs> minimizes and goes on the left over here and waits for you to attack it the next morning i just love doing that but you have to sit at the desk that's the process you can't say ha likh denge yaar then you know ha likh denge yaar aur char din ke baad mera writers block ho raha hai no no it's not writers block it's sheer laziness <laughs> <laughs> can't agree more yeah. the first line of your book is actually a very big hook point i just picked it up read the first line and asked the guy to pack it <laughs> Yeah no that was meant to be the title of the book uh, because the whole book was based on that line which i uh, heard in 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 a bus so yeah so so <laughs> dear your your little boys here otherwise uh, uh, you know it, it this guy st- we this guy is stuck in a traffic jam in 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 a bus and he's a government employee and he is a howrah bridge oh dear uh, and he says he says eta ki eta ki what is this howrah bridge na lawrah bridge you know which is uh, is this a uh, howrah bridge or cock up bridge I, i don't know you know what he means but yeah that's the that was supposed to be the title of the book then better sense prevailed and <laughs> so i think i have been given an, a, a time ultimatum would the audience like to ask anything any question from the audience otherwise we will continue with our yeah she's there is there actually i'm quite excited to be facing you because i've been uh, watching you since your debut on indian television 
Oh, thank you. <laughs> so, yes, my... Um, I have a distinct advantage over this one. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> uh, one of my first crushes, so... <laughs> yes. And uh, I happened to spend quite some time in Calcutta also. I had... That time, it was still Calcutta. I had two postings there. I'm an ex-army officer myself. And uh, more than a question, it's more like a, an e incident, like, you know, Hobena. So army, uh, in ordinance, we have lots of civilians also. So you say something to a civilian that you do something, his first reply is this, Hobena. And the same thing then you give to a Fauji, and within half an hour it is done. Right. But then, like I said, it's lot has changed. I, be, uh, I went there in December, and I went to my old depot. Of course, there nothing has changed because it's a government thing. But city-wise, a lot has changed. Uh, but would you say, sir, the character of the city has changed in any way? Because Calcutta always had a character of its own, you know, compared to so... I have been to so many city uh, places in India, not only cities, vague places also posted there. But ca uh, Calcutta, I found, had a character all its own, you know, which no other city could evaluate. So do you think that the character has undergone a change in any manner? Dramatically and for the better. Definitely. I, I said this earlier on, uh, that when I went back to Calcutta, I found there was a distinct change. Things happen nowadays in Calcutta, which didn't. Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, you, there's always something to, to you know, uh, hurl brick bats at. Like, you know, you're standing at a traffic light and you hear a window shongi suddenly, you know, because that's supposed to be the... Uh, uh, yeah, that, that's mildly irritating. But by and large... Uh, uh, Calcutta is a much improved place, much, much improved. In fact, I'm having difficulty now writing about Calcutta because I have nothing to complain about. <laughs> I'd like to ask you, um, uh, Mr. Jan Kriplani, why did you write this book? Why what did you write the book? Why did I write the book? Yeah. What what was the was there a message you wanted to convey? Was it a walk down memory lane? No, no messages messages. I write letters or send SMSs or you know I, I, my books have no messages at all in them. There is no message. Enjoy it. It's uh, these are nos some some are nostalgic little pieces. Some are whimsical little pieces. The the characters that I write about are. Uh, can be charming at uh, on 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 the one hand and extremely cruel on the other. That's the, that's uh, there are no messages. I am not a uh, priest. No, that's not my job. That's really not my job. Um, uh, you know, that's somebody's. You know, who sits at the head of uh, the country and sends twitters to people. That's his job. That's not my job. My job is to write books. Sending messages up there from Delhi. Actually, I think most of the authors write because they have this bubbling information or bubbling thing happening with a story inside their brain which will burst if not written out. I must tell you, uh, that's an absolute lie when it comes to describing me. Yes, absolutely. Please, I'll tell you, I started writing because for one year I was not supposed to do anything hectic after my heart attack. So I sat and I wrote. That is the reason. There is no other reason. No, I became an author when my uh, when I was pregnant with this one, and uh, the restriction is very very depressing. So my first book is an academic book, a uh, marketing book with Shahrukh as case study. So I thought someone or the other will definitely write one day because Shahrukh is a great marketing case study by himself. Mm. No one wrote, so I wrote. Mm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, are we? Any other question from the audience? Yes. The title of today's discussion was Rains, Nostalgia, Betrayal, and Revance. But I think betrayal was a topic we didn't really touch upon. Can, can both the speakers talk about that? How does that fit into these four sentiments 
अरे आप खबर कागज खोलिए ना रोज सुबह बिटरेल तो हो ही रहा है यार और क्या लिखेंगे उसके बारे में हाँ It's uh, every every news item, every headline is a betrayal of everything. So, writing about it is really not. Uh, And so is life. No, no, life's a bitch, not necessarily a betrayal. <laughs> <laughs> It's far worse. Hmm. Oh yeah, I'll teach him some more. <laughs> sure, yeah. yeah, I Aura, have to now Aura go home and brainwash him. <laughs> What did you hear? <laughs> but no, I think this was a very, very interesting session. W uh, I may have come late, but those who must have heard it from the beginning, the when the volunteer guy called me up, I heard that you were introducing yourself, and I was almost banging my head in the car gear. No, it was <laughs> great that you made it. It was really sporting Thanks of you guys. Thank you so much to have taken it forward and not stopped, and. Uh, Sincere, uh, sincerely, uh, my my gratitude to both of you for. Being and so thank you all, you guys, for you know sitting patiently and listening to us rabbit on about our books. Yeah.